Welcome, uh, everyone, as you, are, as you are joining us. Uh, we're very excited to be hosting this. Uh, Jan, Roll and I, uh, on behalf of Hartford and uh, Somerville Colleges this evening, a, a celebration, really, of, um, of the life and, and legacy of, uh, of Jeremy Hayward. And we've got uh, a brilliant group of Jeremy's friends, uh, former colleagues, some of us who worked for Jeremy uh, in the past to reflect on what that was all like uh, and what it means. And of course, uh, our main guest is uh, Suzanne Hayward, who's just written this terrific book, or really co-written with Jeremy's terrific book on Jeremy's life, which Jan will introduce in just a moment. Um, some bits of, of housekeeping. Do uh, let me have, and Jan, have your questions in the chat, if there's anything you'd particularly like to put to any of uh, any of those speaking as, as we go along. Uh, the session is being uh, recorded for YouTube for you to watch back at your leisure uh, later on. And we'll divide it into four sections. We'll, we'll start with uh, what Jeremy was like at Oxford, the probably underexplored portion of Jeremy's life. And we have uh, Jeremy Clark, a close friend of Jeremy's here from that uh, period to reminisce on that with, uh, with Suzanne uh, as well. And then Jan will then talk to some of the uh, Jeremy's senior colleagues from Whitehall who've also found their way to uh, Oxford. So we have with us Jonathan Phillips and Helen Ghosh, and actually also Suma Chakrabarti, three perm secs who all served uh, with Jeremy uh, in, in Whitehall. Then we'll have a bit of a dig into what he was like as a leader and as a boss. Um, Kieran Martin, uh, who worked with him in Downing Street in the cabinet office, Ollie Robbins too, uh, will, will reflect on, on what that experience was, uh, was like for those of us uh, serving under uh, Jeremy. And then we'll come back to close, to think a bit more about Jeremy's longer term uh, legacy uh, with, uh, with Jan and, uh, and Suma reflecting on his time in Washington, but really the mark he leaves uh, on, on public life. Uh, just for those who don't know Jeremy as well as the, the, the people on the call, I just wanted to start just by quoting uh, a few lines from uh, some of the speeches made at his uh, memorial service. So here we have uh, Tony Blair. I depended on him. And when he was gone, I felt his absence like an ache. Then we go to Gordon Brown. Not often they uh, agreed on everything, but here he is. I never met a public servant who day in, day out achieved so much in so little time. A collapsing pound, stock exchange crash, leak scandals, sacking, banks going under, capital flight, sometimes all in the same morning. Jeremy didn't need crisis, but crisis needed him. Then we jump to David Cameron. He was never ever dour. Even in the darkest moments, he would smile and make you smile. And he was no Sir Humphrey. He was a radical, creative thinker and an innovator. And then finally, Theresa May, uh, who, who talks about the many memories of Jeremy in office, always uh, with his sleeves rolled up. Jeremy was a man who quite literally came to work with his sleeves rolled up. Not just an extraordinary advisor, but an extraordinary doer, endlessly intellectu intellectually curious always looking for the answer, never stopping until he found the solution to the knottiest of problems. Whatever the issue was, Jeremy would sort it. And time after time, he did. All of them uh, remarking that he was the greatest public servant of our time. Just one final quote, which I think is even more uh, striking, uh, which is something Suzanne talks about in the book, Theresa May saying to her after the memorial service for Jeremy, uh, Theresa May said, I think people will look back and notice when he stopped. And I think if uh, there's one thing that I've heard everyone on this call saying and so many others in, in public life and beyond, it's we really did notice when he stopped. So we'll reflect on, on all of that uh, tonight and you're almost welcome and it's great to have you and we're looking forward to a, a lively discussion that has a sense of Jeremy's policy heft, but I hope also a sense of his mischief and humour uh, as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Jan now to introduce uh, the rest of the evening and introduce our main guest, uh, Suzanne. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. All those quotes send shivers down my spine and I can't help but reflect. If only we knew what Jeremy might think about the pandemic. Well, maybe you probably do, Suzanne, but uh, if only he'd been here. But it is an extraordinary book about an extraordinary man. But until I read the book, I didn't realise quite how amazing Jeremy was, how he brought together clarity of vision, intellectual ability and curiosity, understanding of politics, great empathy and an astonishing capacity for work, as well as seemingly an, an ability to enjoy life, 
wherever possible, whenever possible. We're going to learn more this evening, as Tom said, and I think it promises to be a real treat. But I think that we have to imagine that we're sitting around a table in an Oxford college, having some good food, some good wine, and, and the chat will be flowing. So as uh, Tom said, the discussion is going to be in four parts, corresponding to four different segments of Jeremy's life. But the most important person here this evening is Suzanne, and undoubtedly she was the most important person in Jeremy's life. But amongst many other things, I think that she is a brilliant author, because unlike so many biographies that we all read, I'm sure, it was a pleasure to read. I couldn't put it down. I think that I first met Suzanne at a state banquet. It might have been before or after Peter Mandelson nicked my position as Lord President of the Council. And it's thanks to Jeremy's intervention that attention was given to the fact that without that position, I would not have received a, a, a salary. So I'm truly indebted to, Je to Jeremy. To say that the book is fascinating doesn't really capture its huge importance. It shines light onto the inner workings of the civil service and number 10 with all of its physical and metaphorical nooks and crannies. I've got to know Suzanne better in the last three years because she's a Somervillian. The women of Somerville are indeed legendary. They are resilient and super intelligent. But Suzanne is something else. She's way above most of them having spent most of her childhood and most of her adolescence sailing around the world with her family, surviving shipwrecks and head injuries without formal education, she came to Somerville. And I think it's thanks to an amazing tutor with perception and foresight that Marion Dawkins said, come, come to Somerville, come and do zoology, which she did. And then she went off to the other place to do a DPhil. The rest is history, although we do look forward to her autobiography. Um, and with the, following the civil service, she went to McKinsey, then managing director of Exor. But all the time, she was a brilliant wife, mother, even at the most difficult times that one could possibly imagine. But if she hadn't studied zoology at Somerville, then Jeremy might never have employed her, as she said, to work on the Treasury Review, because he employed her because she was a zoologist. We know that's not the case, but I thought it was a great reason. Um, and I think that her life and probably all of our lives would be very different. Throughout the book, she's interwoven love, laughter, pain, values, intellectual discussions, the difficulties surrounding decisions, family and friends, as well as clear accounts of events, sometimes mundane happenings that make up mo most of our history, but also the events which were literally life-changing, world-changing, like the economic crisis. I love the humanity, as well as the humour. How I would like to have seen you, Tom, guarding the room in which the leaders of the G20 were corralled in order to reach agreement on a $1.1 trillion injection of financial aid. And then you did something dastardly with the technology to ensure that President Sarkozy couldn't have his... Um, press conference before Gordon as Prime Minister. So I just wish I'd been there, fly on the wall at all that time. So Suzanne, we've got so much to think, thank you for, and so will future historians. But this evening, let us start where the Oxford journey began. Over to you, Tom. Great, thank you, Jan. Well, let, let's, actually, let's actually ask Suzanne then where, where it all began. What, what, was, what was your sense of, of how um, of what role Oxford played in, in the formation of, of this, this sort of titan we've described. I mean, what was he like in those days? Well, of course, we, we have a kind of eyewitness here who's going to talk in a moment because I, I came to Oxford a few years after Jeremy, so he and I weren't contemporaries. Uh, but by all accounts, Jeremy, um, I mean, Oxford, Oxford was absolutely fundamental. I mean, Jeremy went to school uh, at Bootham School in New York. Uh, which is a lovely school, which he enjoyed very, very much. But it was when he came to Oxford that I think he really found his academic feet. And he realised that he could really go on from there to do anything. I think it gave him kind of huge uh, kind of enthusiasm to take on the world. And he, he knew kind of coming out of Oxford uh, that he had the academic ability to do that. Uh, but as we're going to hear from Jeremy, you know, when Jeremy, and there's two Jeremys in this conversation, it makes it complicated. <laughs> when Jeremy Hayward was at Oxford, he was definitely a work hard, play hard. 
uh, person. I mean, he had a, a lot of fun while he was at Oxford. And some of the uh, some of the tales from that time are, are kind of quite hair raising and also quite funny. So I'm hoping we're going to go on to Jeremy Clark um, now to tell us some of those. And we've got a few photos from the archives that we've uh, that we've dug out. Jeremy Clark has dug out a few of them uh, just to kind of bring back to life what the kind of young Jeremy looked like. In fact, I've got one photo projected behind me. You can see kind of Jeremy, the rather kind of slim figure on the kind of uh, left hand side of that photo, Jeremy in Oxford at the time. So I think in summary, he had a great time. He uh, worked very hard, did very well academically, uh, drank an awful lot and came out in quite a lot of debt, I think would be my short summary. Uh, so this is already quite revealing. But by the way, the photos, that, that not, not to confuse it with another Jeremy, but the photos have something of the Jeremy Irons about them uh, as well, that, that sort of gaunt, blonde uh, look. But, mm. but Jeremy Clark then, um, so did you did you bump into Jeremy Hayward um, uh, in Freshers' Week then? How did you how did your friendship begin? Uh, we we actually had a family connection. Perhaps the first thing to say uh, that Jan has already said in a way is that Jeremy um, changed a lot for the better uh, as a result of his relationship with Suzanne and and having a family, uh, and in many ways was a far better person. Uh, in later life than he was at Oxford. Um, one thing that didn't change was his sense of humor uh, and sense of mischief and that was there throughout. But we had a family connection before Oxford in fact, because um, Jeremy's parents, Peter and Brenda were great family friends of uh, Cedric and Ruth Clough in Glossop where Jeremy grew up in his earlier years before they went to York. And so when the news came through that I'd been offered a place at Hartford, um, my mother said, oh, well, Cedric and Ruth uh, have said that Jeremy Haywood is going to Hartford. And so you must look out for him because Cedric and Ruth say Jeremy is really brilliant. Uh, so, of course, I said, well, brilliant at what? Oh, brilliant at everything. So that was before I'd even met Jeremy. Uh, and your quotes, of course, uh, Tom, at the start, reminded me uh, a bit of, of that. But you can imagine an 18-year-old hearing that about another 18-year-old and what that set up for me and Jeremy. Uh, and we had a kind of competitive relationship um, uh, in some ways. Uh, I think what Suzanne would agree uh, is that he might have been brilliant at some things, but he certainly was not brilliant at everything um, and when when you met him you were struck by the sense of fun that he had but the main thing that you saw was this incredible physique you'd never I've never seen anybody so thin and so kind of frail looking that he would sort of blow over in the wind so all the stories about how brilliant he was at cricket and football I took with a complete pinch of salt because they were completely made up <laughs> And we all remember him as being this, having this ferocious work ethic. Uh, had that started to manifest itself as he uh, patrolled the, the quad at Hartford? Uh, well, he was given a scholarship, of course, um, which meant that uh, he was in the Hartford scheme of people uh, who were spotted as a, as a genius, uh, as I'm sure Cedric and Ruth thought he was. Um, so... He didn't, um, he came with that sort of aura already. I think one of the very few interventions I made in the student in the JCR was to try to get scholarships abolished um, uh, as a result. Um, I, he gave the impression of not working hard uh, because all I spent my time doing was, uh, he, he just drank blank, black coffee all the time and smoked endless cigarettes all the time and played Steely Dan in his room and then went out drinking with, with me and others in the evening. So I, I just never saw him working and he gave the impression of never doing any hard work at all to me. Um, but, but I suppose the difference was that while I was kind of playing hockey and badminton for the university and other stuff he he was actually doing some work during the day um, and certainly his tutors only ever kind of spoke uh, of praise and he sailed through prelims and sailed through most of those those early tests with with absolute ease yeah 
and so just to quote some of his tutors, so, um, so Toby Barnard, um, who was one of the historians uh, here, who taught several of us actually, um, said he was obviously but unostentatiously clever. Uh, and Jeff Ellis, uh, who was also here at the time, said that he was the smartest uh, student he'd ever taught in you know, almost 40 years of, of teaching. So somewhere in there, despite uh, all that hard work, that, that intelligence was, was shining through. Jeremy and I had tutorials together with Toby and, and what Jeremy had took great delight in because Toby was one of these people who, who kind of knew everything about the subject and whatever you said about the subject, he would kind of add to it and, uh, uh, and sort of enrich it really. And, and so you couldn't kind of get an argument with him. So Jeremy's great uh, mission in life was to, to, to set out an argument that was so polemical that even Toby would have to take objection to the, the interpretation he'd put on the events. Uh, so that was the mission in the tutorials with Toby, I think. So Toby also says that, he, Toby says he taught him the 16th century and 17th century non-British general history paper. Um, he said, whether analyzing the French wars of religion, reformations and counter-reformations and European exploitation of other continents and peoples had any later applications for Jeremy, I leave others to judge. <laughs> Was he Jeremy? Was he was he political at that point? Was he was he joining the union or the, uh, the student union? Or what was what was driving that? He did. I mean, I never set foot in the Oxford Student Union because uh, I just found the whole place far too elitist. Um, and I think Jeremy went once, possibly twice, but he. Jeremy actually, although he he was capable of being friendly with absolutely everybody, uh, to the point where I just felt he had no kind of discrimination whatsoever, um, in the sense both both senses of the word, I guess, uh, discrimination in terms of judgment and taste, as well as discrimination uh, in terms of fairness. Um, but he gravitated on the whole towards. Um, you know, people from a relatively kind of ordinary background, which is what Hartford um, tended to have more people of. So those were most of his, his sorts of friends. And he got involved only really in the student politics, again, as um, a kind of source of mischief, really. So he, he managed to persuade one of our friends, Martin, to stand, I think as treasurer it was, for election to the JCR, but purely uh, in order to cause mischief and have some fun uh, when, when, he, when Martin did win the campaign and become, become treasurer. He had, he had no interest in the kind of student politics that the JCR was, was, was interested in. And, and he didn't really gravitate towards the sort of people who, like Boris Johnson, you know, were set out to become prime minister via uh, Oxford, the Oxford Union in the first place. Um, I think we have to see some of your photos, Jeremy, if we can. I think Suzanne may have them, uh, may be able to share them. But is there, is there one of uh, this famous dinner, 1983, a school's dinner? I think it was election night. Let's, oh, let's see where we start. Um, Suzanne, do you want, wh which ones are we going to have a look at? Yeah, should we have a quick look? Um, so, well, by the way, this is Jeremy. <laughs> uh, just to kind of bring back this. Here we have Jeremy on a punt. Because uh, you have to have Jeremy on a punt if we're going to talk about Oxford. Um, this, he wasn't political, but Jeremy, you might be able to explain Crocs. So this was a newspaper that they set up, which was going to be some fantastic entrepreneurial scheme, Mar Martin Collins and him, and he got all sorts of people to write for it. And it, it was kind of supposed to be a, a bit like Private Eye. That was, I think, the, the idea behind it. I mean, Jeremy wasn't completely apolitical. And in fact, he was one of the very few people at that time in our group who was very keen on Margaret Thatcher. So you certainly could have, and I did have lots of strong arguments about the Falklands War and about other stuff with Jeremy and he had political opinions. And at that time they were quite right wing, um, which he changed considerably later, I think. And then Jeremy, I think you have to explain this one. So yes, I, I think it was me who persuaded Jeremy to dress up and wear makeup on, on this occasion. 
this was the occasion of our post-finals dinner, and you can see Toby Barnard and Chris Tyman there, who were, had been two of our tutors. Uh, and I've got the sunglasses on, and next to me is Alistair Blundell. Um, the one... The one thing that stuck, Jeremy was actually pretty popular um, uh, at college. Um, uh, the one thing that stung him was something in Simpkins, the college magazine, where they they changed his name to Jeremy Gaywood. Um, I think he and I had gained some sort of reputation uh, for messing about, uh, and, and that was a, a bit of a kind of Mickey take out of Jeremy. Um, but anyway, I persuaded him then to go full Brideshead revisited for the finals dinner and uh, dress up appropriately and, and Jeremy was up for it. He was dressed a little more appropriately or not, <laughs> depending on your view. <clears throat> and I think I have a final one in here of Jeremy with his parents in Oxford, mm. Brenda and Peter. Excellent. I, I think uh, anyone uh, who was at Hartford in previous years will be very glad to know that one of my first acts as principal was to pulp all previous editions of the Simkin uh, College uh, magazine, certainly going back well before, uh, well before my era uh, here. Um, Jeremy, thank, um, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll come back to you as we, uh, as we go along. Um, but it, it's fascinating just to get that sense of, uh, you know, those early years and that formation of the character that then um, we're going to come on to talk about now, actually. So I'm going to hand back to uh, to Jan to have a have a look with Jonathan and Helen at, um, at really at, at the man who became Lord Hayward of of Whitehall. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that uh, I mean he was obviously incredibly popular uh, at Hartford, um, and as I think you said, Jeremy, he was capable of being friends with everyone, with anyone. And I just wonder how much that that enabled him to succeed in the in the civil service at the highest levels because he was able to embrace everybody and, and sort of get through but we'll learn more about that in a minute because it's fantastic we've got so many former permanent secretaries all oxbridge of course uh, which i think is a great tribute to the um education the quality of education uh, but as i was went to london university i'm thinking oh but you know that's a personal little problem isn't it um, but I think it'd be really interesting to know from uh, Helen and Jonathan's perspective specifically about his working style, um, the impact that he had on policy decisions. Um, was it a collegiate style? I, I presume that it was. But Helen, when we had an email exchange a few days ago, you intriguingly talked about badgers. <laughs> <laughs> What's Jeremy got to do with badges? Is What's he got to do with badges? Um, I, I should start by saying, and, and actually this is why this whole event is just so fascinating to me. I didn't actually know Jeremy terribly well. I'd never worked for him. I'd never worked at the Treasury. By the time I rose to becoming a Director General or indeed Permanent Secretary, first at DEFRA and then at the Home Office, um, that was really the first time I was working alongside him. And of course, his reputation going before him and... Um, I'm feeling even more of an imposter now after hearing from uh, Jeremy and others. Uh, the, the, you know, when the phone rang and you heard that it was uh, Jeremy's on the line and wants to speak to you, your heart would sort of sink and you thought, right, I better, you know, sharpen up that intellect. Um, I, I've got, this, this may be tricky. So um, I would, and, and it was all, almost always the case, particularly when I was at DEFRA, that, that the kind of things we dealt with were not ones that he was constantly thinking about. It was that old, you know, thing about the lighthouse where the light comes around and then suddenly uh, you're in the full, um, the full glare. So I just wanted to say also one thing that really struck me hearing Theresa May's comments. When I did move to be the permanent secretary at the Home Office, almost the first thing that she said to me was, your main job is to discover what is Jeremy thinking. Ah. She thought, uh, since she was, uh, I think this is no surprise, uh, constantly um, uh, at odds over one issue and another with, with um, the then prime minister. She thought the role of a permanent secretary was not to run the department or to provide uh, policy advice, as it were, de novo, but knowing what Jeremy thought. So when I used to have my weekly sessions with her, I used to start by saying, I saw Jeremy N times this week, or yeah. I spoke to him about that, or I, the other. Badgers, I just thought this is the perfect example of uh, what was Jeremy's absolutely great strength, which was getting to the core of the problem. 
So I will not bore you with the science around whether or not you should cull badgers to solve the problem of TB in cattle, which was a great EU issue, a great political issue. You will remember this jam on which actually Conservative and Labour governments took diametrically opposed views, science fascinating. Um, I had to talk to him about the fact, I think it was Hilary Benn in this case, was going to raise this at Cabinet Office, and at Cabinet, and he wanted to know what the issue was. And it was one of those Socratic dialogues where he kept saying, but what actually is the issue? Well, the issue is that there are different political views and it's very tribal. Yes, but why should we care? Well, the issue is that cattle get TB. No, actually, he wanted to get right down to why should government care? Why should government pay? What was the economic value of, say, the dairy industry to the British economy? And it was incredibly refreshing to have that sort of burst of cold water saying, what is the fundamental problem that this is trying to solve? Then all the issues that he would handle brilliantly thereafter about, um, you know, one side against another and different views and the science and so on. But he always wanted to get to what was the core of the problem and to deal with that. And, and that discussion I had with him made me realize that that was the nature of his policy making mind, that sort of incisiveness, um, which I learned, well, I traded on uh, ever after in terms of talking to ministers about what the fundamental issue was and what therefore the solutions were. So that's why I raised badges. That's really good. It's really interesting that Theresa May, and that was her perception that you had to, you as a permanent secretary had to know what Jeremy thought. Yeah. Same for you, Jonathan, in, the, in Northern Ireland. Um, well, 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 actually, Northern Ireland, and I, I, I think Suzanne would, would agree, was, was not one of Jeremy's specialisms. But I'll, I'll say a word about Northern Ireland in a minute, because there was one point in, in 2009 um, when he stepped in at, at my request to get out of a mess which I had in part created. But but I'll come back to that because what I was going to do, um, picking up uh, what Helen said, was to offer a perspective at an earlier stage. I first met Jeremy, uh, like Helen, being someone who hadn't worked in the Treasury, um, in um, 1996, early 1996. And he was then relatively fresh from that fundamental expenditure review in the Treasury and heading... Um, I think, I, I've forgotten what the job title was, but basically looking after policy towards securities and markets, where, where if, as I was in the DTI, you, you felt a mix of, oh my God, what's gonna to happen to our responsibilities in that area now that this young man who is emerging, I mean, his reputation outside the treasury emerging very strongly as a result of the, the fundamental expenditure review has got um, responsibility for it. And I vividly remember uh, having to talk to him about um, which of our two departments was going to take responsibility, we had it at the time, for the ongoing problems in relation to the regulation of insider dealing. Um, and um, one of my senior colleagues in the DTI said, oh, I, you're going off to have a meeting with Jeremy Haywood. Um, and I said, yes, he said, well, very good luck with that. I, 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 I hope you've got your running shoes with you. And I said, uh, and you mean? He said, well, I, I know you think you're quite good, but if you're gonna keep up with that man, you're gonna to have to run very bloody fast. I mean, that was the, that was the reputation that was, that was already <laughs> clearly emerging. Now, um, if I, if I leap to your question about Northern Ireland, um, I, I came across Jeremy again when he was um, Principal Private Secretary in number 10, and when I got involved in Northern Ireland in 2002, but um, only because um, as I was apparently constantly going in to number 10 to see Tony Blair, there would he be sitting in that kind of room, which nobody outside the world of the people on this screen understand as being wholly unsuited to any form of modern government. Yes. There, he'd be, there, there he'd be sitting um, <laughs> alongside Jonathan Powell, who, who, would, who would leap up and we'd, we'd go and see the Prime Minister. And um, all, all my, my most uh, vivid um, recollection of that period is of a Jeremy who was clearly um, 
under huge pressure, as you always are doing that kind of job, but always had the friendly courtesy time to just um, break off and say, things all right, you know, not getting involved in my world, but um, so that's a characteristic. But the, uh, his involvement in Northern Ireland came about um, much later. Um, when we were trying to finalize the second stage of devolution, the devolution of policing and justice powers. And as ever, the two sides in the Northern Ireland conflict had a common enemy, namely the British government. Um, and they had a common objective, namely to uh, squeeze out of us just as much money as we could give. And I had spent many months persuading the prime minister, Gordon Brown, um, the former chancellor, as I regarded him, um, uh, that we should uh, give them another bag of gold. He was deeply reluctant. Um, and I made the great error of someone who's never worked in the centre of thinking that this prime minister, such a powerful chancellor, had finally decided and ordained that the bag of gold will be provided, that my job was done. I simply had to tell the treasury, but I hadn't banked on the treasury of the day. Um, Yvette Cooper and a particular official whom I won't name and who's not uh, on screen, <laughs> much more junior official. Um, and, and, they, and they played very difficult. Um, and so um, I had to invoke Jeremy's assistance uh, to get this particular essential requirement of the final stage of devolution across the line. And he did it so willingly, so easily, but that reflects his ability on the basis of, I may say, quite good briefing from um, um, a limited number of NIO officials, but nevertheless, um, and maybe the support of a, of a private secretary in number 10, who knows? I, I say that because <laughs> Tom's off the screen. Um, but it was the sheer polished courtesy of handling of it, which is what sticks in my mind. An absolutely delightful colleague in that respect. I'll pause. Oh, how wonderful. Helen, I mean, throughout, or Suzanne, throughout the, your book, I mean, the machinery of government seems to have factored very large in Jeremy's life, which is clearly extremely important for the governance yeah. of our country. Um, I can imagine that as a, a permanent secretary, though, it might have been shall we say, discombobulating from time to time, because you, you've got so much to do as a perm sec, you know, all that you're juggling with delivering, and then suddenly this missive comes down, well, we want to reorganise things. How did it affect you? Um, I think the, the most significant occasion that, that Jeremy uh, played a role in a machinery of government issue for me, I think shows him up in an exceptionally good light. Um, so in my period at DEFRA, five years, 2005 onwards, uh, first of all, and I think this was, I can't remember what Jeremy would have been doing at the time, uh, we were reorganised once when climate change work or climate change mitigation work was taken out and DEC was created to, to create a, a role for Ed Miliband. The second time, and I simply, I was trying to work out when this was, but there was a, a later reshuffle where having worked fantastically hard, to build a department, promote good talent, think of new ways of operating. As you say, Jan, suddenly there was that phone call and um, uh, number 10 was on and Jeremy said, uh, they want to break DEFRA up, basically to recreate the old Ministry of Agriculture, which had been abolished in 2001, and a Department of the Environment. Uh, basically, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to think of a good argument why that should not be the case, get back to me. Uh, so I think, and, and that's what we did. And it was one of my, sort of, it's one of my, um, uh, the examples of working as a team that I, I cite most often when I'm talking about teamwork and leadership, where basically I sat at the uh, PC and said, right, everybody, right, executive team, we've got to write this in 10 minutes. Da, da, da. I, I was, I'm sorry to say that was probably taking the, the female role or something. But I was being the servant of my team. Um, and we did it. I mean, we basically explained all the good reasons why you shouldn't do this. I pressed the, the send button, sent it to Jeremy, and I don't think Sue Gray's on the call. Somehow, uh, and no doubt from his um, uh, brilliant persuasive skills, 
they avoided this thing that would have been a, a genuinely and objectively a complete disaster. So that was a perfect example of how he handled machinery of government. Can I just say one other thing? You may be going to come on to this. And um, uh, I, I, I'm sure others won't, won't mind me saying this. Of course, everybody outside the Treasury and outside Number 10 and outside the centre are viewed Jeremy with awe. But there was an element of suspicion, which I think Jeremy admitted himself, particularly in that issue of whether he should become head of the civil service as well as cabinet secretary, which of course he later did. But this sense, this is a man who's never actually run anything. Mm. And I think uh, there was that sense of suspicion. I mean, I worked in DWP, I worked in HMRC and later at, at the Home Office. And I, I think he managed to overcome that, but there was still some sense, certainly on when you were on the receiving end of it, of that the one thing that in a sense would have made him perfect was if he had been running a big delivery department and understood some of that. It, it came back to me particularly, but, but ending with a positive message, I think, about Jeremy, when I was thinking, you know, probably the most painful uh, episode at the Home Office was, was not so much dealing with summer riots in 2011 or the security issues around the Olympics, but when there was a crisis, what crisis, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, at Heathrow at the, at the airports about long queues. And Jeremy said, right, or the Prime Minister, whoever it was then, said, okay, we've got to get 250 extra people on the border to reduce the queues at Heathrow. And Jeremy had to basically drive that through. Uh, and so every day I had to have a session with Jeremy and he'd say, why haven't you got, how many have you got now? How, why don't you have more? And of course, suddenly producing 250 people trained to be border guards at Heathrow was a more or less impossible thing to do. And at the time I felt, I felt resentful, to be honest, you know, here's a person, he doesn't understand the practical problems of turning people, of getting, but, but of course it was Jeremy playing the part that Jeremy had to play. Uh, and, you know, looking back on it, you know, I think he didn't know how we had to train people. I mean, I basically had my directors general getting trained to go and uh, sit in the, on, in the booths at Heathrow. Um, but, but it was Jeremy playing the role he had to play in a very forensic kind of way. That was what he was there to do. It did spur one into thinking, I'm done, we're going to show that man and I'm going to produce the people and so on. Um, so uh, I think I came out of that with greater respect for Jeremy, even though I thought hmm, he doesn't realise how hard that was. We did it and he made a contribution to our doing it. I, I, want, I wonder, Jan, if I may, just how, how, how far back that goes, because I, I do, as I said earlier, my first... Um, impression of Jeremy followed the, the fundamental expenditure review in the Treasury and I know Suzanne was very much involved in that and she's written about it but if you think about his background when he was asked to do that um, and the very radical nature of the conclusions reached um, conclusions which uh, and you used the phrase in the book Suzanne um, the assassination of the mandarins well you know, many of the mandarins in the wider white hall were deeply suspicious of the yeah. endeavor but but there was also um, um a more um analytical response at that time i'm going to get back to helen's point in two seconds which was um i guess that there is a comfort in working with an institution the treasury um however hostile it may sometimes be if you know its structure um, and have got used to uh, working with your particular treasury team, almost an element of agency capture about it. But it occurs to me that he, um, obviously with your assistance and others, um, must have learned a huge amount about the management questions facing Whitehall uh, at that point, which even if he didn't immediately deploy them, stayed with him forever. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think it's a very good observation. I and mean, what's interesting is that Jeremy, and I tried to bring this out in the book, Jeremy was fascinated by management. He was fascinated yeah. by organisation and structure and talent and, and all these topics which, you know, often get treated as slightly kind of second class and not interesting. Interesting, You know, it's for the kind of HR director to worry about all that. But my experience, starting with the FER, was Jeremy realised that 
getting an organization to function effectively was absolutely critical. Uh, and he was completely passionate about the FER work. I mean, he he got into it in an incredible amount of detail. We went around and interviewed every single treasury team, uh, which I think was quite a kind of formidable experience for them and for us. And of course, after the FER, he then managed to convince the then treasury, uh, the head of the treasury, actually, no, just before the FER, he'd gone out to do a kind of three month uh, masters uh, in kind of public uh, in kind of um, uh, administration, which he did out at Harvard, which again was all about how organizations work. And so Helen, you're right. I mean, he had this great insecurity himself about the fact yeah. that he'd never run a big department. Uh, and as I say in the book, there was a moment when he could have done that, when he left working for Blair, but he was considered to be too junior really to take on a permanent secretary role. So rather than kind of moving laterally and doing, he would have loved then. That was the yep. moment when he could have gone and run a department. And for some reason, it wasn't the right moment. And then he went to Morgan Stanley instead. And then when he came in, it was kind of almost too late. He was back in working for Gordon Brown. So that moment was missed. So he never got to do that. But he did have this deep fascination with how organizations work. You know, this kind of quite unsexy topic that most people aren't interested in. And the moment, actually, even back in Downing Street, when he was working for Blair, the moment he became principal private secretary, he started organizing teams to sort out the kind of IT and, you know, let's, let's kind of create a kind of happy places working team and all sorts of stuff. You know, let's, all, let's sort out how all the offices work. So this was a, a kind of passion he had all his life. Um, but he was conscious he'd never run a big department. And so eventually he ended up running the civil service without doing that, which is not ideal, but uh, worked out <laughs> in the end. It must have been quite frustrating, Suzanne, from time to time when, I mean, in number 10, for example, he, he got it working really well. I mean, it's working smoothly under one prime minister and another prime minister comes in and says, no, I've got to change that. And I, I mean, I can see one little bit from your book, which I had a, a personal stake in, which is to do with the sale of the forests, um, because uh, I was a lead campaigner on that. And it was my amendments in the House of Lords, which actually junked the... The, the offending clauses, as it were, in the public bodies bill. But as, as you point out in, in the book, a consequence, that was a consequence of the fact that the um, policy unit in number 10 had been decimated yeah. uh, under Mr Cameron when he first went in to be prime minister. And it was this sort of sale of the forest which made him really realise, oh my God, I need my own people looking at these things to sort of save me from these disasters. That was good. But I think the yeah. sort of the management style takes us on then to the, to the next part, I think, of the proceedings, which is Jeremy as boss. Um, brilliant. I mean, I, I could just listen to this all day. This is this is um, just wonderful stuff. And that recollection of Jonathan's, I think, just captures what it was that Jeremy was so good at, so seeing the timing of when to intervene and then combining the, the tact and the creativity and the heft, as he did on that Northern Irish financial settlement. You know, basically, we've been trying for weeks to get that on the uh, radar of, of number 10, uh, and, and no one was going to listen to me. And then Jonathan had a word with J Jeremy, and suddenly the entire machine, you know, everything was dropped, and we had that relentless focus on fixing it. But it does remind me, Suzanne, that at, not often at the end of that process, Jeremy would, would reach in and, and basically, you know, wrench the system to do something else. And then he'd send us all off on a plane. He, you would expect someone like Jeremy, and it, who was all about proximity to power, to then get on the plane with the prime minister, but he never did. Did he? Was there an issue there about flying, or was he just on to the next issue? I think, I think there were several reasons why he really didn't like to travel. Um, one is he did suffer terribly from vertigo. I mean, Jeremy's dad suffered very badly from vertigo, and Jeremy suffered mildly from vertigo. So he was fine on planes, and. As you'll find in the book, we went on, you know, lots of lovely holidays. In fact, he was very, very good at making sure that he took that time to kind of spend with me and the kids. Um, but, he, you know, he, it wasn't something he would do out of choice. So I, I guess that was the first reason. I think the kind of second reason was he always regarded travelling with the Prime Minister to be, uh, I was going to say a waste of time, which is probably a little extreme, but he certainly thought it wasn't the most efficient use of his time. He could get a lot more done back in the office than kind of crawling around with it. And there were plenty of people who could go and do that. So he only did it in extremis. And there's a couple of times, in the middle of the financial crisis, I think when you were doing the second banking package, he went with the prime minister uh, on a trip uh, and you ended up kind of in Israel. And on the way back, 
sorted out the kind of banking package. So he did it then because he knew he had to spend that time with Gordon Brown. But in general, he found that time was not particularly effective. And I think the third thing is, which is something we haven't really talked about, Jeremy was a very homebody. You know, he loved being at home. I mean, he tended to, I mean, although he worked phenomenally hard, he wasn't somebody who stayed in the office till midnight. He came home. So he would come home in the evening, seven, eight o'clock, so probably not that early, but we would always have dinner together. And then he would sit and do his Blackberry, send out another kind of however many emails, probably quite a few people on this call have received those late night emails, but those were all done at home. He liked being at home. Um, and that was very much a kind of feature of him. Uh, and actually was rather wonderful because it mean, meant that the kids saw quite a lot of him. Um, you know, he wasn't away from the house all the time. I think that was the famous trip where we raced Sarkozy's plane to uh, to Tel Aviv with yeah. our friend. Uh, yeah. And friend. won the race, won the race. That's won in the race. book. Seriously. Um, uh, so I want to come on to, the, you mentioned the emails, we talked about the management style. I want to ask um, Kieran and, and Ollie about what it was really like to work with him. But just one question in, because um, we've got so many questions to, to, to get through. One question from Chris Dane, I think best for Suzanne, actually, which is, you know, we've heard a bit about how he spoke truth to power. Uh, and many of, many of those on the call were, were veterans of this. What was his style? I mean, how did Jeremy speak truth to power? I mean, there are some good examples in the book of that. Well, I think I think he spoke truth to power by being I mean, he never kind of uh, he never kind of wrapped things up, you know, with lots of kind of, um, you know, he was always quite he was always very direct about what he said. Uh, but I think a key thing about Jeremy is and something he said to me was he had the ability to see the world through a politician's eyes. And that didn't mean that he was political, because as we've talked about, I mean, he had his political views, but th that he didn't really bring them to work. Uh, in any sort of kind of strong way. But what he was able to do was to absolutely understand what the what the um, ministers or the prime minister's issues were, what the political landscape was like, what the situation was like in the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And therefore, he would find solutions or find ideas that would fit within that context. And then he would speak truth to power. So what he, what he wouldn't do is try to tell a, a, um, a prime minister who just couldn't possibly do something that they had to do something. He would find a way of putting something forward which was doable. It might not be perfect. It probably wasn't exactly what they wanted, but it was just about doable in the political context. And then he would absolutely kind of be firm. And I think as, as Helen has described, you know, he would know that he would understand the issue right down to the kind of, you know, the most kind of minute bit. And he would put that forward and be prepared to kind of argue for it. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't suggest that that was probably all down to the tutorial skills of um, Toby Barnard and Jeff Ellis and others uh, in this uh, in this quad. I'm claiming it anyway while, while Suzanne's on on mute. Right, Kieran, Ollie. Um, so we've heard about this this wonderful uh, cuddly character who really cared about developing his his teams and management structures. Um, we've also heard about these late night emails. Um, Ollie, what what was your sense of of Jeremy as uh, as an, an inspirational boss? What a terribly unfair question, Tom, but how nice it is to see you. Well, I think we'll answer. Um, no, he was, um, of course, he was inspirational. But I mean, if I could just um, change the mood slightly. My, one of, when I was thinking about this call, one of the uh, recollections that kept popping up, uh, however many times I tried to suppress it, was of, I think, Jeremy's first uh, top 200 meeting. That's the sort of... Uh, a meeting for sort of the uh, the directors general and permanent secretaries across the civil service, and for some reason it was happening in some big grand room in uh, the foreign office, and it was all slightly uncomfortable. Jeremy and Bob Kerslake were sharing the podium. There was supposed to be a sort of Q and A with Bob and Jeremy, and it was all sort of fireside, except the the, the fireside in question was the Locarno room, so it was hardly sort of cosy, and. Um, it was for, for various reasons. I think it was the civil service sort of higher echelons were going through one of their slightly sort of anxious moments. And uh, one of the questioners um, said, uh, you know, are, are you both uh, worried by the people survey results that are showing that uh, that people are you know, really worried about sort of the ability to challenge in the civil service? And there was a sort of seconds pause as Bob and Jeremy looked at each other and sort of wondered who's going to answer. And then Jeremy, uh, absolutely clear as a bell, and with really, you know, a, a dose of aggression in his voice, said, I think anyone who comes to a meeting with me knows that they get challenged. Um, 
and this was a this was a, a, a total kind of misreading of the question, and yet also a brilliant moment. And um, the the fact is, uh, without being so saccharine about it, I hope it it re reveals something really important about his management style, which was frankly, and I think I'm sort of slightly echoing what Helen and others have said here. You you sort of these were meetings you prepped for. <laughs> um, and I, I don't like to think of myself as a lazy person, but I mean, there are some meetings I didn't prep for. Um, and But Jeremy meetings you would prep for. And it was that thing that um, Helen described of, you know, how you would, um, you'd sort of turn up thinking you were there for a conversation about, you know, asylum seekers uh, when I was at the home office. And uh, before you knew it, you know, you were being quizzed on what exactly the conditions were in Northern Eritrea that was causing people to kind of flee there. And it was, you know, with hindsight, it was brilliant. Um, at the time, it could be a bit, it could be a bit frustrating sometimes. It could be, it could be a bit scary. It could be a bit embarrassing, frankly, because you sort of realised you couldn't really remember actually whether Eritrea was north or south of Ethiopia, and you probably should have checked before you came to the meeting. Um, but uh, that sort of that spirit that you were going to be put through your paces, and it was worth knowing the answers. Of course, as others have said. It made you do your job better, and I think the the sort of flip side of that, um, you know, uh, comment about the top two hundred is that one thing I don't think anyone's touched on yet. But I don't think I've ever seen a senior official, especially a very senior official, who did this in the same way. Is Jeremy was accessible to absolutely anybody, and so uh, you know uh, he would get sort of cold emailed from around the civil service by people who were working on things and uh, who'd sort of come across him giving a talk at some event or, you know, their boss had encouraged them to get in touch with Jeremy, as Suzanne's brought out on other occasions, often through, you know, attachment to various mentoring programmes, he would, he would get to know people. And actually, uh, he would just, you would get a reply and you get a reply very quickly. And so the sort of Yes, the sort of midnight emails um, when you were one of those people who, and I mean this, were sort of lucky enough to be often in touch with Jeremy could be um, could be a bit of a pain from time to time. And you'd sort of choose which one of the three you were going to reply to. Um, I think for an awful lot of civil servants, that was part of the inspiration. You could email him and you'd get a reply and you'd feel, you know, to, to use Helen's uh, lighthouse for a second, you'd feel suddenly that beam, quite a warm beam was on you. Yeah, very much so. A mixture of sort of terror and then an extreme concern. Um, and you never knew quite which beam you were, you were going to get. I must admit, as we thought through um, how to run this evening, and you'll have noticed the extraordinary preparations that went into it, um, several moments I heard the voice of Jeremy in my ear basically saying, have you gripped this? Which is one of those famous uh, short emails we would get at, at midnight. And always on just the issue that we hadn't actually gripped. That was the extraordinary thing. He would find the one in the mix that you hadn't really thought through. Um, Kieran, I remember you saying to me once, um, one of the amazing things about Jeremy is that uh, every prime minister before they started would say, we have to cut Jeremy Hayward down to size. And within three months had basically promoted him and was completely reliant on him. Um, what, what do you think Kieran is, was the key to that? But also what was, why was it that we all ended up so loyal to this fairly terrifying character? I think there, there are two quite different questions uh, there. And um, by the way, Suzanne, I brought along the uh, cabinet office mug with the cats on it that I uh, was given as a cabinet office leaving present because given how fond he was of those, I thought <laughs> um, a better reminder. Um, 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 so I think, um, why did prime ministers um, uh, value him so much? Um, I think it's already been said by um, Helen and Jonathan, uh, because he brought you the best deal in really complicated problems. And I remember Ollie and I were talking about this earlier, and he may have something to add on this. On something like national security, which we both worked in, which, like Northern Ireland, wasn't Jeremy's home turf, if you like, um, you'd have a really complicated set of issues. We both dealt with, say, the civil libertarians and the uh, security agency chiefs on really complicated global war and terror type issues. And the really interesting things, if you were in the Cabinet Office Secretariat, as we both were, was that all parties thought Jeremy was slightly veering against their position because he was pushing them so hard 
So the agency thought, Jeremy's been really tough on us. And the, the civil liberties policy people thought, Jeremy's been so tough on us and so forth. And there was this fascinating moment that I recalled earlier as I was thinking about this event where, um, and there's a good passage and a great passage in Suzanne's book about this, about the post 2010 coalition's efforts to bring all the sort of human rights abuse, uh, Guantanamo complicity um, allegations to a resolution. We've been at this every day for six weeks, high level meetings, agency heads and so forth. And Jeremy calls me in and he says, look, I know every piece of advice that's gone to the prime minister and so on has been collective and so on. But this is my moment. You know, this is where I'm going to bring it all together. So we're not putting this, we're not punting this around the system. This is my judgment call. And he says this, this, this. And then it concludes with something like, prime minister, this is the best deal I can give you. And the point was, because it was Jeremy, it was the best deal A, he could give, but it was better than anybody else could have done. And it was good enough for just about everybody. So I think that's why. And, you know, again, if and I can't remember whether the coalition had a specific agenda to cut the cabinet secretary down or the permanent secretary number 10 down to size, but everybody did. That's kind of why. I mean, that was done. The coalition was formed in mid-May. That was done on July the 6th. And there you have a massive piece of delivery of an extraordinarily complicated cross-government matter uh, done in a way that stood the test of time. So I think that's the answer to that um, question. Why did we end up so loyal? Um, I think one of the, I mean, you know, Ollie's story is brilliant about some of the sort of, you know, uh, um, whether deliberate or accidental sort of, you know, um, uh, communications of all of this. But um, when Jonathan told a story about his first meeting with Jeremy and, you know, encountering the legend of Jeremy, uh, it, he he encountered the legend of Jeremy a sort of couple of hours before his first meeting. I had about, I had years of the legend of Jeremy before I actually knew him. Um, um, but there's something about the way he'd um, uh, delivered and the way people talked about him that meant you wanted to win his approval and not just because he was powerful. I wanted to win Jeremy's approval when he was at Morgan Stanley, even when I didn't know him. I wanted to, you know, um, I want, I, he, he, he created uh, a way of thinking around people, which made you think, he, I want this guy to think I'm good which I think was really, really uh, um, uh, uh, powerful. So I remember um, the reason I had this sort of long waiting period was, um, uh, and it was it, it was very strange because um, at the end of 2002, I went to be Gus O'Donnell's private secretary. Jeremy was at number 10. He popped in for his occasional bilateral, but they would talk amongst themselves in private, didn't get to know Jeremy. Then he went to Morgan Stanley, then he came back. So I was in this weird position where um, I was still private secretary to, the, to Gus O'Donnell, the cabinet secretary, but also a hugely close friend, neighbor of Jeremy's of long uh, standing. I haven't realized quite how close. So I'd been Gus's private secretary for five years, um, but Jeremy had been away for most of them and I didn't really know him. So then I came back and I thought, right, Jeremy came back to Whitehall. I thought, well, you know, how am I going to win his approval? You know, what am I going to do? And people, Ollie and all their friends said, you know, just you'll deliver something and you'll have to stand up to him and you'll have to argue with him and so forth and you'll win his approval. So the first time Gus said, well, you know, Jeremy's coming back. Can you negotiate his terms and conditions? And I thought, well, that's throwing me in off the deep end a bit. Um, now, luckily, Jeremy, not least, you know, Suzanne's spectacularly successful career, his own uh, time at Morgan Stanley, he didn't care about a few thousand pounds. Now, I, I either way. So we did that in five minutes. And I thought, well, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. But I don't think I won his approval there. Then there was Gordon Brown's package of constitutional reform, something I knew something about. I pushed back. Suzanne's covered uh, this in, in the book, but I don't think I impressed him very much. The moment that it actually happened was, um, and uh, I, uh, love, I love this story, was um, when Jeremy transferred from the cabinet office to Dining Street at the start of 2008, in the first days of 2008, with the reforms when Tom Scholar decided to go back to the Treasury and so forth, for reasons I won't bore anybody with and probably forgotten, there was a um, there was a time gap between the political announcements about Stephen Carter and so on coming in and Jeremy uh, coming in. And Jeremy got very agitated about this, um, but it was the holiday season and Gus was on holiday. And for those who know Gus, Gus took holidays very, very well and was therefore completely uncontactable. I was also on holiday. I was at my in-laws in Houston. So at two in the morning, my time, after a very fine night out with my father-in-law, the phone goes at two in the morning because it's 8 a.m. in London and it's Jeremy. So said, we've got to get this announcement out. We have to. And I said, oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, I'm hemorrhaging power. At this point, I just burst out laughing. I said, what, what are you laughing at? I said, you're Jeremy Haywood. You're not hemorrhaging power to anybody. And actually, when I got back, I felt the newfound respect and I'd finally managed to, to get the Jeremy Haywood approval that I'd craved. So that's how he did it.
Excellent. Um, Ollie, do you want to come back in on that point? Because I also want to get your, your sense of, you know, both you and Kieran then, then, you know, went on to hold these very senior jobs yourselves in the civil service and a sense of, you know, how, how those roles had been changed by, by Jeremy and, and by the way he led. Yeah. So I, I think um, the thing I found very empowering about the way in which Jeremy led and, and managed me and encouraged me was uh, he always wanted to know what the right thing to do was and what the best thing to do was. Now, of course, often that's a matter of subjective and political judgment, but that was that was the sort of that was the starting point. Let's kind of get get to the heart of this, as others have said, and then kind of work out what the real options are and then what the best of them is and make a recommendation. So there was a there was a strong sense I always got from him that just sort of simply describing the options, let alone describing the problem, wasn't enough. You have, you have to come up with what you personally think is the best thing to do. And he encouraged senior people, I think, uh, and people he, he wanted to develop as senior people to kind of, you know, to, to stand up for a point of view and an, an, evidenced, uh, an evidenced proposal. And I think, I mean, sort of that, that all sounds a bit abstract. I mean, the things I remember, and I'm afraid most examples are just a bit too recent to be safe to tell, but the things I really remember actually are when firstly, he would be great at defending the fact you had made a recommendation. So, you know, faced with the prime minister, upset with the recommendation that he or she was getting, uh, Jeremy was very good uh, at those moments of real difficulty, actually, at saying effectively, so what do you want him to be doing? Just sort of sitting there telling you what you want to hear. No, you, you need to hear from this guy what uh, the problem is and what he thinks the best thing to do is. So please respect that. Occasionally, kind of in those terms, which was incredibly supportive and empowering. Secondly, I think, and it never, never, as it sounds like he was capable of doing at university mischievously, but I think he uh, occasionally relished picking a few battles with prime ministers and, and sort of reminding them that he was an independent thinker and was capable of telling them what he thought the right thing to do was, even though he knew uh, that they weren't going to agree. And, you know, the, the sort of stereotype of the very senior official that I, uh, that you still sometimes get, and I absolutely hate, is of people who spend a lot of time at the centre as kind of courtiers. And, and, and the Jeremy model of being a supremely successful official at the centre of government was not to be a courtier. It was almost occasionally, deliberately, to be an anti-courtier. To understand the court, but to be slightly distant from it and to be capable of challenging and pushing back. And, you know, I, I think I sense the pattern. Suzanne, you, you'd be as well qualified as me to comment, but almost sort of choosing quite a decisive battle with each prime minister he served relatively early on in his relationship with them to establish that he was he was able to do that and it was legitimate that he would occasionally do that so i just think there was a sort of uh the you know what 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 i've taken from all that experience and i think a lot of people had and the the sort of you know without making people dwell on the sadness of it you know the reason his departure and then death affected people so much across the civil service was i think that uh quite you know quite sort of general sense that what Jeremy encouraged civil servants to be was to do their best and to say the right thing. Yeah. Um, that's maybe quite a good moment just to go to Suzanne on one question um, that we got from, uh, from James Lazarus, uh, because I think it's maybe fairer to put this to you than to the more recent um, civil servants, uh, Suzanne, if I can, uh, which is basically truth to power. Um, what would Jeremy have made of the last uh, two years? James says, you know, would he, what would he have done about uh, what James calls the sustained attack on senior services, premature departure of poem sex, uh, and forced resignation of uh, cabinet secretary? Would he have tolerated the regular breaking of the ministerial code? Wow, that's quite a question. Um, so I think, I think, as I make clear in the book, you know, Jeremy was very, um, felt very, very strongly about defending the civil service. And he did, particularly as he became more senior towards the end, and on a number of occasions, he actually uh, put himself in quite a difficult position vis-a-vis uh, -vis ministers to defend civil servants. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting. And I, I do try to tell the book in quite a neutral way, because I'm conscious that, 
you know, writing a book about your husband is a tricky thing to do. And I was wanted to do it in a way which was as kind of even handed uh, as I could. And some people may well say as they read some of those stories, well, there are times when Jeremy shouldn't have stepped in. I think if anything, I think one could argue he sometimes stepped in too much. But he very strongly believed that um, you need to step in to defend your senior civil servants because they're often put in a very difficult position where they're trying to trade off you know pressures from ministers to do things which may be slightly political uh and pressures from the civil servants to go in a different direction and so jeremy would go in and defend people and not always but quite often he would defend that and he also believed very very strongly in the civil service code and the ministerial code uh and there is a little story i have in there which actually it's quite a funny story as well which was all about uh, prisoners voting uh which is a a uh, slightly esoteric uh, subject, I do realise, but uh, it, it, it was under Cameron and Cameron was very concerned about prisoners voting, as some, some on this call may recall. Uh, the European you know, Court of Justice had ruled that the UK had to allow prisoners to vote. Uh, Cameron really didn't want prisoners to vote. Uh, and it, it came to a kind of deadlock where Cameron wanted Jeremy to work up options which would be breaching what the European Court of Justice was asking for. And Jeremy was saying, well, I can't do that. That's against the civil service code, also against the ministerial code. But I will work up a whole series of compromise options. So Jeremy, as always, was in the mode of what's the kind of best compromise, which is going to be legal, but it will be a minimum requirement to kind of get us around this. You know, So, for example, maybe we could just let prisoners vote once they're out on license. Maybe it's only people who are serving very short sentences. You know, there will be a compromise here, which will make the ECJ comfortable, uh, will make you comfortable. Uh, but it was a, a kind of head on collision with Jeremy basically saying the civil service cannot work on something that is illegal. So if you want to, if you want to work on something else, <clears throat> you can, although it's a breach of the ministerial code, but certainly the civil service code, I won't breach. So I think Jeremy, you know, had he been around, I think he would have been keen to defend uh, his colleagues, very keen to uh, defend the civil service code. But I think he would have had also huge sympathy with both ministers and civil servants dealing with something totally unprecedented. And I think it's very easy to kind of stand outside and say, well, you know, this was done this way and, you know, people should have done that or should have done something else. I mean, it has been an absolutely extraordinary time. And, and Jeremy was very human and actually was not somebody who would come in and, and kind of, although he was very tough and as Ollie has described very well, people were very, um, people people came to see him on their best behavior, you know, really having kind of brushed up what they were thinking. He was not an aggressive person anyway, and he was not somebody who called out or deliberately found fault with anybody. So I think he would have been very understanding about the challenges. And I, you know, I think, uh, I mean, his real question would have been all the way through, have we got a grip on this? Which bits have we got a grip on and which bits have we not? His favourite, yeah, that was his favourite question all the time. So just to prove I have a grip on this still, I'm going to hand back to, uh, to Jan for a, a, a session with, with Suma. I just want to just put one very quick uh, final question to, to, to Kieran, actually, around that truth to power uh, theme. We've heard about Jeremy's talent at speaking truth to power himself. What was it like as someone working for him and with him when you spoke truth to power to Jeremy? Did, you know, was he an easy person to disagree with? On the few times he might have been wrong, dare I say. No, but because of the, I mean, Suzanne's story about prisoner voting brings back a lot of memories and you, what, what a cabinet secretary gains from that is such huge credit because I remember the prisoner voting thing very, very well. And you know, I mean, there were two remarkable things about that. One, Suzanne's mentioned, which was just the instinctive integrity of the man uh, that he's going to stick up for it. The other was the fact that, you know, he did a hundred other things that day as well as, you know, launch a robust defense of the um, code and it sort of all went seamlessly. So um, uh, so you you could do it and uh, you could do it for two reasons. Um, so, I mean, you know, Jeremy, like everybody else, made the old mistakes. He made fewer than most, but I mean, um, uh, I, I do remember you know, him sending emails that ended up in judicial reviews and so forth and helping him overturn those and, and things like that. And you could just tell, um, you know, eventually because of that respect, you could just tell him that he'd got um, uh, something wrong. And I think, you know, I mean, everybody else has said it, but um, I remember, I mean, the biggest sort of test of my own uh, career, I think, shows you why you could um, 
uh, tell uh, truth uh, to power to Jeremy. So in 2017, in the middle of the election campaign, when I was running the cybersecurity center, um, the NHS got hit by a cyber attack. So, you know, NHS election campaign, you know, it's pretty bad. Um, uh, Jeremy, uh, firstly, checks in all the time as to how you're doing. Uh, secondly, sort of says, look, you know, I don't really know much about this stuff, but I'll be there. And um, uh, and then, you know, I do remember the centre was doing something wrong and they had taken a bad organisational decision and you were able to do it. So, you know, it wasn't um, easy, but everybody else has said, Jeremy made you um, be on your game. And I remember when I took the cybersecurity centre job and uh, had to undergo media training because it was a public facing job, actually dealing with the media was much easier than I thought it would be. The thing that media training helped me with was dealing with Jeremy <laughs> because actually, you know, just like good media and an open press leads to better accountability and sharpens you up and makes you better at what you're trying to present. So uh, Jeremy was far more, Jeremy was far better than that than John Humphreys or or any of the grand inquisitors he was the sort of non-broadcasting grand inquisitor and he did it and as suzanne said he never I, he never lost his temper with me and rarely if ever saw him lose his temper in those meetings but that forensic way of just bringing out the best in people meant that actually if you could handle it then ultimately just like a good politician on a tough interview can actually say something really robust and get the message across so can you and kind of i mean it's for suzanne to say because she knows him far better than anybody else in this call but i think he kind of knew what he was doing in that respect he knew he was bringing out the best in people brilliant um he could also be very disarming in the way he took you off I, you just reminded me of a moment when I had accidentally forwarded on to him an email chain that, that contained a description of him from, from one of us on this call, uh, and me, uh, as the Dark Lord. And I just got a very quick reply, always lowercase, because often Jeremy's emails on the Blackberry were just very fast lowercase, just saying, be careful with forwarding email chains, uh, which made me much more cautious for, forevermore. Um, Jan, back, uh, back to you and to, uh, to Seema for the last, uh, the last part of our conversation. Yeah, I, mean, I think that this section, the legacy, is really, really important because um, when senior civil servants live to a great age, as many of them do, especially when they're on the red benches, it has to be said, um, they, they, they have an opportunity to sort of promulgate their own legacy, to talk about what they've done, to give speeches, to write articles. And Jeremy didn't have that possibility. So I think you have done... You have done Jeremy, but you've done the governance of this country, I think, a great service in, in writing this book, uh, Suzanne, because I think the whole country, or people who care in this country, will have learned a great deal about the workings of the government, the governance of the country, and Jeremy's legacy. And I think that, uh, Suma, you knew Jeremy very, very well, uh, both as a permanent secretary Secretary in Justice, but it seems to me that whenever there was a need for a, a new part of the civil service to kind of look at economic things or whatever, he would call on you to do many things. I mean, you, you were there throughout his career, serving him, serving the civil service. But I know that you've known him for an awful long time, and I just wonder how you first met. And I'm intrigued by his uh, driving and cooking skills, which I think that you were... Uh, party to when you were both in DC? Yeah, or the lack of them in his case. Um, I mean, I think, thanks, Jan. I mean, first of all, can I just say it's a brilliant book. I mean, Suzanne has done us all a great service in the country, a great service, I think. It's a rattling good read. And um, I think Jeremy would be quite uh, sort of embarrassed by the fact it's a bestseller, uh, you know, all about him. But it, it is a really great book. And you, I'm waiting for Suzanne's book on her uh, time in the oceans, which I've read in draft. So I know how good that is as well. Um, I guess with me and Jeremy Clark, um, there's a sort of different aspect to this uh, memory because um, we've been friends with him before he was a living legend in a way. Uh, Jeremy even longer than me, I mean, back in Oxford, but uh, for me, when in Washington really, we actually met a month before we both went to Washington in 1988, in the summer of 88. We were introduced by a mutual friend um, at the Base Clef, uh, a club in uh, London's East End. and. Uh, we actually bonded over our love of music uh, in particular. And I used to be a DJ in my spare time in those days as well. And we, um, we went, got to Washington and over the first three months, I learned a lot about the skills he lacked, frankly, 
uh, as well as being, he was brilliant in many other ways, but this is a man who had passed his driving test first time. I have no idea how, because quite clearly he had no hand-eye coordination. Um, and I made him drive once uh, on Massachusetts Avenue and he caused a pileup within 10 minutes and uh, I had to put him back in the passenger seat and he, and he looked so pleased. He was never going to drive again, clearly. And Suzanne, I think, had the same experience as me with him on this. Um, there's been attempts at uh, showing his sporting prowess. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a sentence in Wisdom, which actually from his school days, amazingly mentions him. And he used that to convince me for a few weeks that he'd, you know, he'd turned down trials with Yorkshire Cricket Club, County Cricket Club, Man United. Uh, the first time we actually had a kickabout, he pulled a muscle, and he didn't have any muscles to pull, but he pulled a muscle. Um, we actually even assembled a ski machine together in, in his Washington flat, which I then found the next time I went round, he was using as a clothes horse. He was just putting all his jackets on, on the thing. So, uh, but the thing that really sticks out in my memory is the famous uh, cooking experience with him. I mean, he, he loved a party. Gus said at his memorial that, you know, three things Jeremy loved were policy, politics, and parties. And he loved parties. So he's persuaded me one evening to have a joint dinner party, of course, at my flat, not at his. Uh, and he said, let's go, let's go shopping at Safeway. This is on Wisconsin Avenue. So we went shopping. I was, uh, you know, at the vegetable counter, meat counter, buying some fresh produce. I couldn't see him. Then I saw him emerging from the tin section. Uh, we got, he wouldn't tell me what he'd bought. We got back to my flat. I started cooking a curry as the main course. He said he'd take care of the starters. Guests started arriving. And suddenly I noticed he was opening a tin of asparagus, a tin of asparagus, not fresh asparagus. And he started wrapping these little pieces of ham, which I'm convinced this day was spam, around this asparagus. And he then had the gall to say to all our guests, Suma's made a very nice starter. You probably like it very much. And then he took claim credit for the curry at the end of this. So he was, uh, his chutzpah was unbelievable, but his charm, that's one of the things I remember. And I suppose the thing that we haven't dwelt on a bit beyond the sort of great uh, career, professional career, is that he had a very uh, good set of close friends. I mean, Jeremy and I amongst that set, but he, nour you know, he nourished that set of friendships very, very closely. He was uh, good to be with, good company, he cared about how we were all feeling, uh, and very, it was very open in those relationships. Uh, and I, that's the, the sort of part of the legacy that I think uh, I will miss a lot, uh, personally, obviously, because I knew him in that part of his life as well as professionally. Professionally, I mean, uh, my colleagues, my former colleagues have mentioned many stories, and I remember all of them too well, and particularly the top 200 story that Ollie uh, told. I remember that event because Jeremy had come to me to be, help him prep for the event. And we prepped the speech. I and mean, I think he did a really good speech, actually, um, much better than he was expected. But we'd forgotten to prep the Q&A. <laughs> and Ollie quite rightly remembers the first question. And afterwards, Jeremy thinks, oh, well, that wasn't so good, was it? That <laughs> so so um, that's right. I mean, but wonderful memories. And I think for me, I mean, in terms of legacy, I guess, professionally, is this great cleverness, but never a show off. Um, I mean, I always found him really clever, knew a lot about things, but he wasn't going to show off about it. And really that he was a, a very creative human being. Helen said he always wants to get to the heart of the problem. He was very solutions oriented, but the solution he always came up with was never the lowest common denominator, just what would pass for consensus. He would try to do something better than that. Uh, and I thought um, he was fantastic at that. Um, I think, he, you know, people often said, you know, could he really be head of the civil service when he had never run a department? But actually, as you, as you all brought out, he was always interested in management. Um, I did tell him when, when they split the roles, that it was a mistake to split the roles, and he should keep the roles together. Um, he tried to persuade me to apply, but I wouldn't apply because they split the roles. And I think it was, he understood later on that it was a mistake and it was best kept together. But he had a fundamental uh, interest in management from the days of the fundamental expenditure review, even the Harvard course, when I visited him there in, in Boston, he greeted me with five awfully boring management textbooks that he'd been reading. He thought I should read these as well. I couldn't bear the idea, but, um, but he had actually a deep understanding uh, of a lot of management issues, even though he hadn't got the experience that I guess some of the other permanent secretaries had got. Uh, but I think he was good at that. I think the other thing that, it's always struck me about him is that something that 
all of us who want to be good public officials uh, have to be have to get good at and he was the master of this he did understand how politicians politician thought about issues he could look through their eyes as suzanne said in a way that i think all of us found a little bit more difficult than he did and that's why i think he actually stayed so long at the center uh, of power he essentially worked uh, for two coalitions the former one between the lib dems and the tories but also the, so we say, de facto coalition between Brown and Blair. Um, he helped both of those function, very, very well brought out in Suzanne's book, actually, uh, in the way he did that. Um, because he could look at it, look at each problem through different pairs of eyes, um, and he could find a creative solution to the problems. That's a legacy that I think as civil servants, we all can learn from, frankly. Suzanne, I wondered if you wanted to say anything about the legacy. What is the legacy that you hope will be the, the lasting legacy? I think it, I mean, he's a wonderful human being, and I think that, that that comes out of your book as well. And I just, I hope that that goes forward because as everybody around this table will know, I mean, civil servants, they don't always have a great name uh, like politicians, but I mean, Jeremy is just a phenomenal human being and he served his, his family, his, his friends, but also his country. And I think that's just extraordinary. But how, what's his legacy in your terms? Well, I mean, we've talked about lots of things this evening and I think and Suma's just summed it up incredibly well. Um, I think, I mean, there are two reasons why we both decided to write the book. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about whether to write the book actually, but there are two reasons really. One is, um, you know, many people don't really understand what the civil service is. You know, it's a, it's a black box. People understand what a politician is. They understand how, how that works, but they don't really understand the civil service. And even when I was writing the book and I interviewed almost 200 people for the book, because uh, Jeremy kept on telling me, if you're going to talk about that, you've got to go and talk to so-and-so. And so, because of course, Jeremy, with his usual forensic uh, point of view, it wasn't, you couldn't just write about something superficially. You had to go and talk to the five people who had actually worked with him on it. And you have to go and read the Leveson report, not just write about it. So it became a bit of an extraordinary task to do this. But anyway, um, uh, you know, what I realized when I talked to people is that, you know, civil service is much misunderstood. People either see it as incredibly passive, you know, a minister comes in and just says, I want to do X and the civil service meekly goes off and does it. Or they see it as incredibly Machiavellian. You know, there was once a, a kind of cover of The Spectator that had Jeremy as a, a puppet master. And as I think it's become clear as we've talked this evening, you know, it's neither of those. It's somewhere in the middle. And sometimes uh, a good civil servant will be very proactively putting forward policies, but ministers will always decide. And so part of the legacy, certainly a part of the reason for writing the book is I think to try and explain that to people, because I think, and Jeremy actually told me this once about McKinsey as well, you know, you could hide away as an institution from the media, but eventually you'll get attacked by it. And it's much better that people understand institutions and have some sympathy with it, understand how it works, understand it is both its kind of flaws and its strengths, then it hides away. So that, I hope that's part of the legacy. And that's one of the things I wanted the book to do. Jeremy also wanted the book to be a bit of a gift back to the civil service. He wanted to give back his memories from all of those years. Uh, and some of the more obscure things, actually, you know, how, you know, he dealt with things after Black Wednesday or prisoner voting, how he'd stood up for the civil service code. All of these are a bit of a kind of a legacy and a gift back from him to the civil service through the book that people can go back to. Because the civil service, like many institutions, is terribly bad at institutional memory. And that was all about to kind of disappear in one go. Uh, and then I think there were two things that he was particularly passionate about. And, and uh, as some people know, we've, we've kind of set up a, a kind of Hayward uh, Foundation to try and preserve these. Uh, and Ollie was our first Hayward Fellow uh, at Hartford College, which was fantastic, got off to a fantastic start. Um, and those two things that he really believed in were policy innovation and diversity within the civil service. And those are two things he really stood for. Uh, particularly in those last years when he was head of the civil service alongside being cabinet secretary. And I think we're, you know, I'm certainly intending to try and preserve those. I know many colleagues here will as well, but, you know, trying to keep the civil service being innovative about policy and trying to get the civil service increasingly to reflect the makeup of the country. Uh, not just gender, actually. Gender, in, in funny sort of way, is the, one of the easier ones because it's very visible. But some of the trickier things, like trying to get much more educational and kind of... Uh, 
diversity in the civil service is something which, you know, I th hope that his passion for that is also part of his legacy. Thank you, Tom. I think that you should close the session. We're at Hartford, really. But I just wanted to say that I think that your book, Suzanne, should be required reading for every politician who aspires to ministerial office, because most, minister, most ministers don't have a clue about how the civil service really works. And this is speaking truth unto potential power. And I think it's really, really important. Tom, over to you. Absolutely. And, and, and every aspiring civil servant, I think, as, it, as Tony Blair says in, the, in his um, contribution, you know, every aspiring public servant should study the life of, uh, of Jeremy Hayward. And I hope that uh, those who, who will watch this and are watching now will, will go away and, and, and do that and will we'll consult this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful book as so many people have said. Apologies if you can hear the film crew pulling out just in the, in the street uh, outside. I think this has been just a, a brilliant hour and a half and I, I, I certainly could just go on for hours and hours. And I wish we were doing it, as you said, Jan, over a, a longer dinner and a drink. And, and of course we will do that properly soon, but we've, we've basically moved from understanding that that sort of willowy uh, Jeremy Irons blonde figure in the Hartford quad or more, more often as Jeremy Clark has described in the Hartford bar and occasionally in tutorials with Toby Barnard and, and others through the spam covered asparagus days uh, that Suma has, um, uh, has told us about. And then into that period, you know, that Helen and Jonathan and Kieran and Ollie have spoken of, you know, that domination of, of Whitehall and, and, and policymaking as this sort of force of, uh, of nature in the corridors of power, but always driven by that sense of, of extraordinary purpose that runs through this whole story. Um, and most of all, be behind that intellect, as, as everyone here has described, this humanity uh, and charisma, uh, which was such a, a powerful part, as, as Kieran said, of why we, you know, who came up in the next generation of, of civil servants were so loyal uh, to him. Uh, so I really want to thank all of you for a brilliant session, Jan, for, uh, for hosting. Um, but I mean, Jeremy, for the insights on the early days, Suma as well, insights on the days and the legacy, Jonathan Helen, who served alongside Jeremy, Kieran Ollie, who served so closely with him in number 10. And of course, most importantly, Suzanne, for, for writing this book, but also being willing to then share these, uh, these stories and, and lessons from it uh, with us all tonight. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, please come, uh, please do read the book. Uh, please, um, anyone who is watching this who has more questions, I'm sure that Suzanne will be willing to take them in various different formats uh, in the future. And so we'll come back to those as well. But for now, a, a huge thank you to, uh, to all of you and uh, enjoy your evening. Uh, let's raise a glass to the great Jeremy Hayward. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Good night.